As I'm heading out to the golf, we get word from Houston Center, Air Force One, you have uh, fast movers coming up at your seven o'clock. Not a big deal, we'd ask for fighter support. I go to the mill aid, the mill aid then tells me he has not asked for the fighter support yet. We're being jumped by aircraft that we have no idea who they are. At the same time, he lets me know that the Air Force has advised them that there are foreign nationals in the Gulf of Mexico training in our fighters, and they're heavily armed. Once again, luck of Tillman. I got guys on my wing, I have no clue who they are, and they're coming up on me fast. Houston, we asked the question, how fast are they? Houston comes back, they're supersonic. They are trucking at us. But we get the faded radio call that I'll never forget. Air Force One, Cowrie 45, flight of two, we are your cover. The beauty of the whole thing was the fact that they were speaking perfect English. Might have been a little Texan, but they're speaking perfect English. <laughs> they were not foreign nationals. They joined up on us, fighter on each wing, and they protected us for the rest of the day. The president at that point makes the, makes the decision he wants to get to the ground because he needs to address the American public. We take the president to Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana. We land there. As we land there, Crop dusters are all over around us and they are, the fighters are rolling in on them, et cetera, making sure that they stay low to the ground. An un, uh, unknown individual comes off the New Orleans Lakefront Airport, a civilian in a light aircraft. And he's, unfortunately, my um, angle coming in was coming right over New Orleans and he's taken off, coming right at me. The fighters go ahead and call out, you know, hey, uh, Air Force One, we, you know, uh, target bra 275, 162, la da 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 da. I explain to these guys that I'm a heavy guy, very proud of the fact that I can take a meal and go to the bathroom. What are you guys talking about? They tell me I have unknown aircraft off the nose. Two's gonna roll out, he's gonna go ahead and identify him and splash him if necessary. Even a heavy guy knows splash him. I go ahead and ask the fighter guy, who has shoot down authority? You do. Uh, that's the coolest thing ever. I pick up the phone. <laughs> I call downstairs, flight attendant answers the phone and said, hey, let the president know the fighters on the wing say that I have shoot down authority. All I can hear is a little chuckle in the background. President, everybody laughing because Tillman thinks he has shoot down authority. <laughs> we go into Barksdale Air Force Base. When I land at Barksdale, I've never seen so many B-52s on the ramp. We taxi by and the president gets out. He addresses the nation. I immediately go into their command post to try to find a place where I can get the president of the United States underground. They give me all the secret places and I'm very thankful, I shake hands. I come running back out to the plane. The wing commander then advises me that I've either done the smartest thing or I've done the stupidest thing. Hell, I'm a colonel trying to make general. I wanted to be a very good optimist. Hey, what's up? let's go with the smartest. The guy said, yeah, it's a very secure location. The dumbest thing you did though is all these planes have nukes on them. We're doing a nuclear exercise. If anybody had been following you, you brought them to the wrong place in the world. Gave the man a little hug, told him, hey, that's our secret. <laughs> Still didn't make general. Abadon is the brand of choice for pilots who want innovative, easy to use avionics. And the new IFD 540 GPS Navcom sets a new standard for simplicity in communication and LPV navigation. As a slide-in replacement for existing 530 series navigators, and with a highly intuitive touchscreen control, the IFD 540 makes it much easier to access the information you want when you want it, reducing head down time and making flying more enjoyable. Finally, you have a choice, and the choice is easy. Avidine. President of the United States then made the decision he needs to get back to Washington, D.C. We wanted to slow things down, so we brought him underground. The plan was to take him to Offutt Air Force Base, get him underground. Departed Louisiana immediately, brought him to Offutt, got him underground. He had a chance to talk with the nation's leaders and folks all around the world. He stayed underground for a limited amount of time. When he left the plane, the plan was to spend 12 to 15 hours there at Offutt until we could get Washington secure. At this point, we could not confirm Andrews Air Force Base would, secure, would be secure, nor the route from Andrews to the White House for the helicopters Marine One. So we were delaying to try to figure everything out. The president goes underground. Talks to a group of people. I go into base operations, trying to get everything set up for the recovery. A young airman comes from behind base ops. Sir, sir, I think the president's heading back to the plane. No, I don't think so. He said he'd be here 12, 15 hours. He goes, no, 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 he's in the wing commander's car. Guy was waving, you know, and all that stuff. I was like, ah, oh, that's my guy. Got it. <laughs> she immediately gives me a ride out to the aircraft. I get on the aircraft, come up the stairs. President Bush is already waiting for me, a bad sign. He goes ahead and gives me the, the usual, Tillman, it's time to get home. Everything was serious. Don't let me make levity of the whole situation. It was serious. Flight attendants were crying around him. The president had his arms around him, letting him know, get back to work. We've got to take care of America. 
He goes back to his office. I leave off at Air Force Base, trucking home. There are no radio calls on any of the frequencies. We, with a couple other planes that were associated with us, were the only folks flying back home in the entire United States. An eerie feeling. As I start heading back, they're pulling fighters off the major cities, Chicago, Milwaukee, et cetera. Fighters are rolling in on us. Did I need them? No, they're, but it's cool. They were taking care of business. They were the military letting the president know that, hey, we're here, we support you. As I start heading down, going back home, I want the fighters that are behind me to go ahead and cover me and bring me into Washington, D.C. The reason being is those two fighters were from Ellington Air Force Base, the president's guard unit. I couldn't have written history any better. They eventually caught up with us over the Shenandoah Valley and made a 360 degree turn to allow them to catch us. At the same time, the United States Air Force sent fighters from Andrews Air Force Base off our nose, fighters from Langley off the right side. It was a giant fur ball over the Shenandoah Valley with all these fighters. Protected them all day long, doing a lot of things, and then here in the end, gonna get killed by my own folks. We moved the F-15s where they belong, way high to do the big shoot down. F-16s, we let them join up on the wings. The F-16s that were sporting us all day, they came underneath us to go check out Andrews. F-15s running on the tail. F-16s coming on the wing. All right, when you say on the wing, if my hand is the fuselage, my thumb is the wing. On the wing is on the wing. This gentleman decided to come on the fuselage. So <laughs> he came inside the wing. So all those things you've heard about, you know, aerodyna aerodynamics being screwed by a guy in front of your wing and all that kind of stuff, it's true. But it is the neatest thing ever to have an F-16 right there. So neat, the whole staff is looking out the window as well, because that's where the guy was. He slowly moved out. We came into Washington. As we descended into Washington, you could see the Pentagon and smoldering. That was the first real sign that we actually saw of any kind of damage in, into the American public. Two days later, we take the president on, a, once again, a covert mission to McGuire Air Force Base, helicopter into Ground Zero. He goes to Ground Zero. He sits on the destroyed fire truck, trucking with all of the firemen. You remember the days of the guys yelling out, George, you know, take care of business, and the, you know, we can't hear you, and the president gets up there, America can hear you. And that's what we did for the next eight years. We took it to the American people, and the president took care of business, as well as all of you folks. Welcome to Airborne, the latest programming initiative from the Aero News Network. Hosted by Ashley Hale, Airborne is a visually stunning weekly high-def newscast featuring guest appearances and commentary from some of aviation's leading dignitaries, as well as ANN's own familiar faces. With aggressive reporting, extensive video, and a number of special aero features, Airborne offers truly engaging, fast-paced aero news content and analysis of lasting value to all of aviation. This picture of the American flag being raised over ground zero is the coolest thing ever. I've got the picture sitting on my desk signed by President Bush. It still sits on my desk now in the civilian community um, while I work for Discount Tire. Just a little plug for Discount Tire. But <laughs> best, best tires in town. Uh, I just, uh, um, shortly after that, the President of the United States made the decision he wanted to go to Afghanistan. We could not get him into Afghanistan. Afghanistan was the Wild West. Impossible to defend, defend against a bunch of guys horseback and camels with rockets. You just can't do a lot against that kind of uh, manpower. Next event was Baghdad. Early 2003, the president made a decision, we're going to Baghdad, we're gonna go have dinner with the troops. About, at that time, there's only about four to five of us that knew about it. Senior staff, um, his chief of staff, deputy chief of staff, Dr. Rice himself, and then eventually they advised me to come up with a plan to try to get him into Baghdad. This is the picture of the Baghdad airport. After I left that meeting, I thought, you know, this is crazy, because the president was adamant that I could not use military support on this mission because we were scared the military would go ahead and, uh, you know, all of you in the military, you know, if you learn something, you pass it up your chain for fear, you know, someone's going to make fun of you or whatever it is. But by the time you tell one guy, 100 guys know. So we could not take that chance. The president wanted to make sure that nobody in the region knew about it so that no serviceman or woman would be injured. I took this picture with a lot of intel reports, plotted all the mortar fire that hit the airport all the RPGs that went off, all the rocket attacks on aircraft, whatever it was, I plotted them all. There was one location, thank God, it was a hammerhead at the end of the runway that had not gotten attacked. 
Okay, Army, Marines, you know why it hadn't gotten attacked? Uh, come on, even Air Force guys. Air Force guys, range of a mortar. Yeah, Air Force guys knew that. So it was totally the function of the mortars. The mortars could not reach that far. Big river there, what the guys would do from the town, they'd bring in their Toyota pickup trucks with a mortar in the back, cross the river, go ahead and fire. A guy on the airport would say to him, hey, the mortar hit the corner of the taxiways Charlie and Delta, significant damage, whatever. That guy would log it in, elevation such and such on the corner of Hussein in Maine where I fired, log it in, he's ready to go. I plotted all these for two weeks. Came up with a plan of attack. My problem was I could sneak them in there. I'm positive I could sneak them out, but I had to pick up 60,000 gallons of gas. By the time I landed there, I would have an, an hour's worth of gas, and I could go into my escape zone into Kuwait. But I needed gas to get out of there. The backup plane also had to go to a foreign country and get gas. I had to defend against these guys. These guys are the guys who could sit in their backyard as you're coming into Baghdad and gun you down and then go back to the barbecue. You had to defend against them. Plane, highly capable. Didn't want to take a chance. Two 747s required. Two planes that we have. One's a decoy, perfectly identical. One plane went into a foreign country as a backup, unnamed foreign country. The problem is, is when he went into that country, declared an emergency, he landed, waiting on us. The country then arrested him. They surrounded the aircraft and told him he had arrived unannounced, totally illegal in that country. State Department had told me that once everything was out in the open, they would go ahead and advise that country that everything was fine. The problem is, is President Obama's pilot, Scott Turner, he was the guy sitting on the ground in this country. He kept calling me, hey boss, they really are gonna arrest us, how much longer? That's gonna be like another two hours. Oh, you're killing me. Yeah, yeah hunker down. Okay, got it. That's what he did. He couldn't say anything until actually two hours and 45 minutes later after landing. Now that number came from the fact that once you did an incident at the airport, it took three hours for all the locals to, to basically muster and start shooting into the airport. So we gave the president a little over two hours to go ahead and meet with the troops. Aero TV's live coverage of the 55th annual AEA International Convention and Trade Show is brought to you in part by the following sponsors.